Um, my name's Karma and I'll be hosting this session. I work at the University of South Australia and teach in their food and nutrition and pharmacy programs. A little bit about my background, I grew up in Adelaide and leaving school I loved chemistry and I loved food. So I undertook a um, degree in uh, or a double major in chemistry and microbiology in science and my first job was at Berry Estates working up in their um, winery lab. I absolutely loved that job and one of the managers at the time there was invited to um, set up a new premise for Stanley Leasingham in central uh, New South Wales and invited me to come up and be the quality manager for him. So by 21 I was quality manager in um, a winery and working for what I thought at the time was one of South Australia's better wineries. So that was quite exciting. And I worked up there for about five or six years and really loved that particular job. Um, for a number of personal reasons, chose to come back to Adelaide and for about 10 years was working for the Australian Government Laboratories here testing food, um, both for their imported export programs and the local program here. So I got to see a lot about the good quality food that was leaving our state. I got to see a lot about the poor quality food that was entering our state and was lucky enough to um, advocate a lot for South Australian food. I also, in that job, worked on a number of projects for people like Choice. Has anyone seen Choice magazine or know of Choice magazine? They do market, market basket surveys where they buy a typical shop of food and then um, prepare it in a way that would normally be prepared within the home. Um, nowadays, it's using taste recipes that you could get through Coles and Woolies. In the old days, it was Women's Weekly, and prior to that, it was Margaret Fulton, depending on where you fit in your demographic. So I certainly got to see a lot about the composition of food and was very happy in that job and was doing a little bit of research when I had two wee babies. And I was on maternity leave with a five-month-old and a two-year-old, and the federal government closed their laboratories in Adelaide, and I was offered jobs in both Melbourne and Sydney but only wanting to work part-time after I returned from maternity leave, I looked around for other options. And teaching seemed a good part-time option. I would never have, at 18 or 19, thought I could have been a teacher, but um, that was an option and that was my short-term plan. 20 years later, with kids both at uni now, I'm still teaching and I love that job too. So I've got to work at both um, TAFE, Adelaide Uni and UniSA. They are all very good teaching institutions in Adelaide um, and I'd highly recommend all of them. If you're geared more towards a hands-on approach, then certainly TAFE is a great place to be. If you want to enjoy a little bit more about the science, then either of the universities is a great place to be. UniSA also has a sister program in Hong Kong and I travel across to Hong Kong to work with staff and students over there a couple of times a year and i am um, never failed to be amazed with how many people over there identify with South Australian food as being clean, green, highly nutritious and being of a very high quality. Um, I think um, one of the privileges I have of my job too is um, I judge for the South Australian Food Awards and I've met um, a large number of people through those awards but also had the opportunity to go into many food businesses and see what exemplars they are for our industry. They are very well operated for the most part and producing high quality food. Um, in many cases they're many uh, very innovative as well. This morning's um, newspaper has an article on somebody making cheese out of Lonsdale that's a non-dairy based fruit from nuts and soy and a whole pile of other ingredients. We would never have dreamt a non-dairy based cheese maybe 10 years ago and that innovation is happening right here in Adelaide. So I think we're, in, in case you haven't guessed, I'm a very passionate advocate for the South Australian food industry. So with that, I might um, introduce Kate who's also seen the light. Kate has 10 years experience as a lawyer and was playing around with a, um, beer and brewing as a bit of a hobby and now has her own distillery. So welcome, Kate. Thank you. 
Um, so yes, we, uh, my husband and I started Smiling Samoyed Brewery, which is based down in Maiponga. Um, me having previously been a lawyer and him having previously been a software engineer. Uh, we've been brewing down there for four years now and um, have learned a lot in that time. And uh, just about to go on an expansion for our brewery. Craft beer is a really growing part of the industry and um, there will be jobs in the sector and we're hoping to employ some um, brewery side staff in the coming year. Up until this point, it's just been my husband and I who have done all of the brewing for Smiling Samoid. Uh, but with our um, new bottling line coming online next year, then that'll give us a bit of increased capacity and we'll need some extra hands. We also have a brewery bar down at Maiponga and I think that's one of the lovely things about these craft, boutique, beverage um, opportunities and artisan um, food products as well, like the cheeses, having, you know, us a brewery door, having cellar doors where you can come and interact with the products, see where they're made, meet the people who've made them is a really great experience. So all of my employees at the moment are in my brewery bar side of the business. So we employ um, 18 people on that side of the business and just myself and my husband on the production side at the moment. So that's us in a nutshell. Um, Hugh comes from Bickford's and I've been privileged enough to have a look inside their company a number of times. Many of you may not know that uh, Bickford's have put a lot of effort very recently into making children's cordials that are nutritionally a lot more sound and much lower sugar in them than what they used to be. So most of us would identify with the old style cordials that Bickford's uh, traditionally made um, with the uh, bitters and the lemon, bit of lemon in them. Um, but they also do a number of other products. So I'll introduce Hugh and let him describe some of the other things they do as well. Thanks, Karma. Uh, most of you would probably know Bigfords for the cordial. Uh, probably what people don't know is the Bigfords cordial started on Hindley Street, just behind us here in an apothecary. Uh, the original Bigfords cordial was a cure for scurvy, but they suddenly discovered that this cordial was far better in the hot climate as a refreshing drink than it was a cure for scurvy. So that was in 1874 that we've started, and the company's still with us today. These days, Bickford's is more than just about our cordials and soft drinks, although that's probably where we're best known for our products in supermarkets, which we do all manufacture out in Salisbury South. Uh, we're now a multi-beverage company. So, in fact, we have uh, two distilleries, one in Queensland, but we're probably most proud of the one we opened in Renmark called 23rd Street in October last year. Uh, 23rd Street Distillery took over the old Angos uh, brewery, uh, distillery there and now produces brandies, vodkas, as well as a gin. And we're very proud of the fact that we won a couple of double golds at last year's uh, San Francisco Spirit Awards. So a real, real backing for us and great to see some regional revitalisation up there in, uh, in the Renmark. And we also have um, function centres up in Renmark, which is good for us because it's allowed us to have some big events up there and to engage with the local community. Uh, we also have our winery in McLaren Vale, known as Beresford, uh, that has a, a function centre as well as a cellar door. Um, we have a pomegranate farm up in northern Meningery, so we really are quite across a number of different products now, and even that pomegranate farm, what, what fruit we don't send to Europe as A-grade fruit goes into our juices that we produce in Salisbury South. Um, we're always looking for talented people to work for the company. Being a manufacturer, we look for people across all aspects of the business. Uh, in 2019, we'll be starting a new ultra-clean production line up in Salisbury South, and that's going to be looking for expertise in um, skilled engineers to help run that operation. Uh, and, and we're going to be starting that recruitment process in the next six to 12 months. But for now, we're always looking for people across all as aspects of the business, and we're, we're proudly South Australians, so we love being able to employ local people find the right talent across all aspects of the industry and uh, I'd suggest you come and visit us on the Bigford stand if you can and have a talk to us. Thanks Hugh. Um, lastly we have Sasha. Sasha's been lucky enough to train as a winemaker and tour the world uh, refining his talents but more, likely, uh, more recently returned to South Australia, of course, who wouldn't want to live here? and has got into distilling. So I'll hand over to Sasha to tell you a little bit more about his life. Uh, thank you, yeah, so I'm the founder and distiller at Adelaide Hills Distillery. Um, we're about 35 minutes away up the freeway. Um, as Karma said, my background is winemaking. Um, I think that's a really good way to get into the beverage industry because you learn a lot about um, flavor chemistry, production, um, and also trying to sell something in what is a really, really difficult market. 
um, as I'm sure Big Fids can attest to. Um, we've been growing over the last few years. It's definitely a booming uh, industry. Um, we're building our new site uh, as we speak. I spent this last week putting most of it together, which was fun. So excuse my um, tired voice. Um, yeah, many jobs on the way. Cellar door and hospitality is a big thing in the industry, as was mentioned. Um, and yeah. I should have also mentioned, feel free to ask questions at any particular time. Is there any um, myths or stereotypes? We might go through each of you um, involved in your industry that we could dispel here at the moment. I'll, I'll start. I guess um, just looking at the gender br makeup of um, brewers and um, going into brewing, I, I thought I was pretty much alone, but that's not the case at all. And there are more and more girls coming on board um, on the brewing side of it. Um, it's a really, really interesting job. It's a physical job, but it's, yeah, it's fabulous. Um, and I'm one of the state coordinators now for the um, Pink Boots Society, which is a society of women brewers all around the world. So, um, yeah, it gives you a great network of other women in, the, in an industry. That is, it is male-dominated, but there are more women in it than you'd think. I think, Kate, too, when I first started in the wine industry, um, certainly when I moved to New South Wales, I was only the, the only single female professional staff member on site. And even when I came back to Adelaide and worked at the Australian Government Laboratories, again, for at least five years, was the only professional woman on site. Having said that, there are lots of other females in um, a number of other positions across um, sort of these, these factories and food processing visit, uh, uh, facilities. So you're never short of company. It might not be in your neighbouring pro professional role, but there are plenty of other women that are working in these food factories as well. Hugh? Certainly one of the myths we probably face is that be competitive in, uh, in the drinks industry. You need to be a multinational or a very large sized business. I think we show as a small to medium sized business based here in Adelaide that we're in fact winning against the big players. So we're, we're winning against Coddy's, which is owned by Heinz, a US company in the cordial sector. In juices, we're, we're growing against Ocean Spray, which is owned by North Americans. So by people, by Australians supporting local and uh, buying Australian, we're in fact seeing Australian industry competing, out competing some of the big multinational competitors and by buying locally, you're ensuring that continues. And, and that does mean that the jobs stay here in South Australia. So we are always, uh, it gives us great pride that we're able to recruit and, and bring in more South Australians as we grow and as the success continues because people are supporting local. I think I'd just add a, a comment to that. Again, it comes back to a quality product. If you've got a quality product, people will go back and identify it and keep buying it. Um, if it's not a quality product, there's so many choices out in the marketplace, you just move on and buy something different. And it You said you're out competing uh, Coddies and, um, in the marketplace. Is that nationally or just within the state? No, that's nationally. So we are 73% of premium cordials sold in Australia are now um, Bigfoots. And 22% of cord every, uh, one in every five bottles of cordials sold in Australia now is Bigfoots. So we take great pride in that. And we're in fact growing when the Coddies, the Schweppes are in decline and having to pay to hold on to their shelf space. So... A lot of the interesting fact is that if you go to New South Wales or Queensland, they think Bickford's is a local brand. A lot of people take it on as their local Australian brand, so it works very well for us. So yeah, it's national success. And um, Hugh, would you be happy to share some of the other brands that they might recognise in the supermarket? Because I suspect many of you identify with Bickford's in the beautiful old style bottles and the traditional flavours, but you may not be aware of the children's range they make that are marketed under a completely different label. So yeah, we, we're, we have five portfolios of beverages, so everyone knows Bickford's of course. We also have Fruities, which Karma's referencing. Fruities is uh, preservative-free cordial. Um, we're the only kids position preservative-free cordial in Australia. It's 50% juice, no artificial colours, no artificial flavours, uh, and then no artificial preservatives. So it, it's, it is unique in the fact that versus all the others there, full of colours, full of flavours, it's an all-natural product. And we have a lot of people with kids who have very specific dietary needs coming to us saying, thank you. Thank you for giving me a product that helps. So that's our cordial portfolio. We have premium ambient juices. You'll find in the, in the ambient juice aisle near the ocean spray or near the um, 
the golden circle in that in that section, and they're they're in significant growth. Um, we also then have uh, our carbonate portfolio. So traditional sodas. If you go to On the Run, you'll see our traditional sodas in the fridge. Um, we then have a few other carbonated beverages within that section. We have our waters. So Aqua Pura. You'll see in a number of uh, shops with uh, flavoured water as well as a straight water. And then there's our syrups portfolio. Uh, we have milk mix, flavoured syrup, and our iced coffee mix that will be a hundred years old in a couple of years' time, and that continues to grow very well because it's a great tasting iced coffee. There you go. I hope everybody's learned that and will support those products in the marketplace. Um, I think the other thing too with South Australia that's really unique with um, the way consumers support South Australian produced um, products is perhaps exemplified by Spring Gully a couple of years ago when they were looking at going into receivership. The word got out. People were asked to buy a couple of um, bottles of pickled onions or their chutneys or whatever just to bail them out in the short term. Um, only as recently as maybe a month ago, I was speaking to, to an employee from Spring Gully and they've cleared all their debt and they're back into making money and they're on a trajectory to be back into the marketplace. So any other state in Australia, they probably wouldn't have got that support. Um, but we're very lucky here that consumers will support local has saved them and they look like they're going to go on and be a better, bigger and better company for it. Sasha, would you, have you got any myths that you'd like to dispel? Uh, yeah, I'd probably like to pick up on Hugh's point. Um, there is always a way into uh, the industry or into the market. When I started, um, I was a winemaker who just spent six years traveling, so I had no money, um, very little resources, but I managed to start a business um, and find other businesses uh, around Adelaide that would partner and help um, uh, help each other grow. So I've, I've now entered into business with the Hill Cider Company, uh, making 100% natural ciders um, from apples in the hills uh, and mismatch brewing. Um, and together we share a distribution network, um, we share a production facility, um, we can grow together. And that's something in Adelaide that is quite easy to do because it's like, hey man, I know you from school, right? Yeah. <laughs> Let's do something together. Um, but I think really the biggest... Um, the biggest myth or whatever for someone wanting to get into the industry is the real um, fuzzy romantic feeling that you get when you think about making beer or wine or spirits. Um, and you have to remember it is still a job. Uh, it's a lot of hard work. Um, I know brewers is sort of 95% cleaning and uh, just cleaning and wet feet. Uh, wine making is probably 80% cleaning and distilling is a lot less than that. But <laughs> It's still, um, it's still a lot of work in early mornings. I might just, if I can, build on Sasha's point. Um, we, we see a lot of applicants come through who have degrees that are very relevant for the roles we're looking for. The people that stand out are those that have work experience in the exact field they're going for. So we just brought on a, an assistant brand manager in wine. The fact that she had some time working in hospitality, some time working at a cellar door, put her head and shoulders above the other people that had a very similar degree. So if just committing yourself to an industry and getting that experience is that real big difference. Wonderful. So are there any particular challenges that you would think might inhibit people making a transition into that area? I know certainly we teach our students to look at transferable skills and to look outside the square. So just linking into what you're saying, a career in hospitality or making coffee gives you people skills, interpersonal skills finance, time management, dealing under pressure. So learning how to identify some of those skills and see where they might fit into other industries is, is useful and then capitalising onto that. Did, did you want to say anything else? I can, what are the challenges going to you? Um, so I have quite a lot of resumes that are emailed to me and they're keen home brewers and they're looking to make the transition to becoming a, a um, full-time brewer and um, that's generally not exactly what we're looking for. We are looking for someone who's got some formal training in brewing 
Um, so both my husband and I went off and did um, the graduate certificate of brewing through Federation University when we were setting up the brewery. So to have all of that chemical background about how beer is made and how fermentation happens and how starches break down and all of that, we want someone to have a good understanding of that, which home brewers may well have, but we would like them to have the piece of paper. Um, to that end, I am a board member of the Food and Beverage Development Fund, which funds people doing training in this area, obviously food and beverage. And applications are open right now if you have some training you want to undergo. So um, look it up. The application forms are on the website. Give Carol a call. She's our executive officer. Um, she'll give you some great advice. Sorry. What was the website? So the website, it's Food and Beverage Development Fund of South Australia. So if you just type that into Google, it should come up there. Um, uh, if you go to the Smiling Samoyed Facebook page, I've got a link up to it as well to go through to the applications. And um, that provides funding for between, like courses from between $500 and $10,000. And there is some specific funding set aside to go um, towards somebody doing the TAFE microbrewing course um, in this round as well. I think there's one more week that the applications are open. Yeah. So, yeah, get on to it if you can. One of the challenges I think should be aware of is certainly given there's a lot of competition for roles. So I think I might take a slightly different angle and say how do you get cut through so that the hiring manager picks your resume versus the, the, the many others that there may be around. And the tips I'd say was be as succinct as you can. Um, as someone who does a bit of recruiting, when I get a four-page cover letter, I don't, it, it doesn't put me in the most positive light about that individual. If they can condense that all down succinctly without spelling errors or using the word I repeatedly, that's going to stand out because that person's clearly masterful with their, their words in there and, and they're very succinct, which should make them a good business person. So um, I think just putting a lot of effort into the resume and the cover letter and, and trying to find out from anyone you know in the industry, what are they looking for? What appeals to them? Because those tips can be the difference between you ending up in the no pile and the, and the move forward pile. And that's a real challenge when there are many measure applications for certain roles. And perhaps researching the business and tailoring your cover letter to meet the needs of the business, not a one-size-fits-all generic letter. Sasha? Um, just carrying on from that again, um, I found uh, in my experience um, the best way to get the good job and the good job that you want is to figure out who can give you that job and make friends with them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so... In the, I mean, I don't, I'm not so experienced in the non-alcoholic beverage industry, but in the alcoholic beverage industry, everyone's pretty relaxed and chilled out. Um, not many people have a resume um, once they're not young anymore, you know? Um, so I think if you can get out there, meet people, um, they'll be in the bars, they'll be at the Wheat Chief, um, say hello. Once, you, once, you, once they know your name and you know their name, you've built a relationship and then your emails will be read um, and you're much more likely to get a job. Wonderful. Um, you did mention, all of you have mentioned that um, some of the jobs are a lot more glamorous than what they appear to be on face value. Um, how would we like to describe a day in the life? So what would a typical day be like, okay? So for me, there isn't a typical day, like every day is completely different. Um, when we started the business, it was literally myself and my husband who ran the business, so we did absolutely everything. So we manned the bar, we made the wood oven pizzas, we were brewing the beer, we were packaging the beer, we are doing all of the admin. Um, so yeah, a lot of that we still do ourselves. So yeah, a day can be sitting behind the computer, replying to emails, trying to get that um, never ending to-do list down. Um, it can be this week I was in the brewery for two days just packaging beer, so loading bottles onto the bottling line, hoping that everything capped nicely, that the capper was behaving itself, um, taking full bottles off the line, putting them into cartons. Yesterday I drove around the Fluro Peninsula, which is absolutely beautiful, did about 180 kilometres delivering beer to various wholesale customers, dropping in, saying hi, seeing how everything was going. So, um, yeah, it can be very, very different. And then I have all the sort of HR tasks as well. Is there a question over there? 
You said it's just you and your husband, and you were at uh, Fleury Peninsula. Do you deliver to uh, all the other venues as well? Um, so I've got someone who does the logistics for me in Adelaide, but I do the logistics on the Fleury Peninsula. Okay. Thank you. A day in the life. <laughs> Sorry. I'm a brand manager, just to explain. So a lot of people think a brand manager is pure marketing. I'm a brand manager is kind of a business generalist. So you, you're across many aspects of the business, but you specialise in marketing. So every, there's no two days the same, and that's kind of why I like the role. It's, there's always something different to do, but a, a day can include updating your, spud, uh, your spend or your budgets, um, going to an innovation meeting to work with the project team to ensure that, that next new cordial line or juice line is at the right stage of development and coming along. You have to go out the back and get your hands dirty every now and then. It might be helping on the line because there, there are a few staff down and they need someone to, uh, to assist or um, packing boxes to go out to the state sales team. Um, a lot of people think, uh, you know, marketing being fairly glamorous or it's all about lattes and, uh, you know, sitting back in bean bags. <laughs> Not so much so. Very busy days. And, um, but you do get some interesting things like media buying. Creating adverts can be a lot of fun. Um, so there, there are those creative aspects, but there's a lot of planning, negotiation and dealing. And, and it's about relationships as well, knowing everyone in the business and keeping your project on track. So quite diverse. Um, yeah, I guess it's the same for me. Um, it, very random job for me at the moment. Um, yeah, I guess the interesting thing, um, and what's different to a lot of other industries, uh, is when you're kind of uh, <laughs> trying to avoid getting other people to do it for you. Um, so if something breaks, you know, suddenly you're an electrician or a plumber um, until you stuff it up and <laughs> get someone to do it for you. <laughs> uh, but yeah, pretty random. You kind of, I mean... And I guess for us right now, we're growing a lot, so we're trying to balance, um, you know, marketing responsibilities versus production responsibilities. So um, when we're in the you know peak season, like around now, it's all about production, making as much as we can, um, and not ignoring all our customers and the bars and stuff. Um, in winter or spring, um, I'm probably doing a bit more drinking and running around, bar hopping, um, going to festivals, interstate, um, and doing that sort of thing. Yeah, random, yeah. Sounds good. Um, just to sort of extend that, uh, we've talked a little bit about some of the new products that have been developed for the food industry, and I certainly believe there's a lot of innovation happening in South Australia. Would you like to describe... I'm not going to ask you to um, sort of uh, spill all your secrets, but perhaps the last product that was released into the marketplace, what might that have involved? So have you got a, a new beer or the latest beer that you've developed, Kate? Um, so the, I guess the one that springs to mind was we did a um, chocolate orange stout and that was a collaboration between um, one of the hotels in the city, the Griffin's Head, and, um, and us. And they came down and did the brew day with us. There's a lot of work that goes into it before that, though. So um, we collaborated on the particular idea for the style of beer that we were going to do. We did some research. We did a first pilot brew that we weren't happy with because it didn't hit the alcohol specification that we were looking for. So then we did another one that was more like what we wanted but didn't have quite the orange character that we were looking for. So we did some experimentation with that as well. Um, and then we did it in a big brew that the um, people from the hotel came down and did the brew day with us. And, um, yeah, it's really interesting to come up with those new ideas and to see what comes out at the end and how it's received by the public as well. Uh, a new product we recently released is our pink grapefruit cordial, in case anyone's tried it. Um, typically when we develop a product, we use a lot of consumer research. So we go out there and ask consumers, shoppers, what do you like? What are you looking for? What's not on the shelf that we could fill that little niche? Because for us, fulfilling that niche is where the opportunity lies. 
This, the pink grapefruit actually came out of our partnership with Quant Qantas Airlines. So we started with them in 2013 as the official welcome drink. They wanted to have a welcome drink in the economy class because anyone that's flown economy knows you walk through business and see them with their champagne and feel a bit second rate. Qantas decided they were going to introduce an economy class welcome drink, which they decided in the end would be our cordial, because for them it worked with their airline. They can just uh, put it into PET bottles, take it up in the air, and then use the water that they serve. And um, this happened to be the most popular flavour from that arrangement. Um, and we rotated it out, so they have a thing called menu fatigue on airlines, where after six months people that fly a lot get sick of the same product. So they rotated out that flavour, we gave them another one, and it was so popular we decided to put it on the shelves. And the benefit of that relationship is all of a sudden people knew it and were and jumped on it and it's now doing quite well for us we're selling in the order of eight units per store per week which is a way we measure performance in in retail so that's a, just a recent renovation for us um yeah we just released something uh, a few weeks ago um we're starting to focus more on whiskey production now so up until recently we we're all about sort of gin liqueurs um gin and liqueurs. Um, so we thought, why, um, why spend all our time trying to um, imitate the Scottish, trying to make Scotch whiskey in Australia? Um, why not be Australian and make Australian whiskey in Australia? Uh, and we started using uh, native Australian grains in the mash bill. So if anyone not, if you don't know what whiskey's made, it's basically just beer distilled and then put in a barrel for a couple years. Um, so we took out some of the barley malt from the beer, uh, replaced it with wattle seed, a native Australian grain. Um, we used the starch in that to create the alcohol, to distill, to put to barrel, um, to create the whiskey, which isn't whiskey yet because it's only one year old, but it's a spirit nonetheless. Um, I guess that's kind of where my industry is heading, is sort of seeing what's around you, um, what's Australian, what's unique, uh, what gives us an edge overseas, and then figuring out how to use it and make it taste good. Certainly, uh, wattle seed is very trendy overseas and very um, identifiable with Australia. Um, one of the courses I teach at UniSA is around food product development. And from time to time, we've had students use wattle seed in their products. And um, certainly, wattle seed powder is very easy to work with, but the wattle seed themselves, be careful, they could break a tooth without trying too hard, so. Yeah, and they're toxic, so. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you have to roast it like a coffee bean yeah. uh, to break down the toxins, and that's what gives its beautiful flavour as well. So, yeah. yeah, don't eat it off a tree. You yeah. might. Yeah. Um, having been in last lives of, involved in product development, although it sounds like there's a lot of work to get them to market, and there certainly is, um, it, there's no greater joy than seeing the little product you've laboured hard over released in the market and be accepted well. Not that I'd akin it to having my children, but it's that sort of um, uh, degree of proudness that you have when you see your own product doing well in the marketplace. Um, any other comments that you guys wanted to make? Hi. Uh, just with your distilling and the whiskey, I know water is quite an important part of making the whiskey. Um, where do you source your water from? Oh, we're in the hills, yeah. so we got beautiful water right there. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I figured as well. I, just, I was just curious. Yeah, no, that, that's it for us, yeah. Do you, um, do you find there's any particular properties of the Adelaide Hills water that like different I know in scotch whiskey the purity of the water there and the minerals that are in the water give it a different quality does that have any impact uh yes um I guess really you want firstly clean water so it doesn't ruin your your batch um in a few years ago um I was at a, a spirits conference and um we did a water tasting which I, was, I laughed at initially until I tasted the water. Um, and it's interesting, the, there's massive differences. So like the examples they gave, which were vastly different, was one was um, iceberg water from Scandinavia or something. It's pure iceberg, whatever. The other one was one that had filtered through limestone before it was bottled. Um, and they gave the analysis of the water. The iceberg water was super pure, just clean water. The other one had heaps of uh, salts and calcium in the water um, and 
remarkably different flavors and mouthfeel and, and everything. Um, and it kind of, I think it sort of split the room on what was the favorite and it comes down to personal preference. But if you can drink the water and it has, you know, you can see two just plain waters and they taste different, that's really gonna have a big impact on your, your product in the bottle. So like for making gin, we're 42% alcohol, the rest is basically water. There's almost, there's more water than anything else, right? So if you get nice, beautiful water, you're, you're ahead. Um, and I was actually chatting with the brewer at uh, Mismatch Brewing, um, and he's a bit out there, but <laughs> he's talking about like stripping the water back and then adding salts in based on the analysis. That's exactly what we do. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I was oh. Just going to ask how, yeah. how she deals with the limestone. Um, yeah. So we have um, an on-site bore, and um, the water yeah comes up from there. It's um, potable straight out of the ground. It tastes great straight out of the ground, um, but very mineral rich. And um, yeah, too many minerals extracts too many tannins from the um, from the barley, malta barley. And um, so, yeah, we've got a reverse osmosis on site and um, all of our water we RO and then we add back salts depending on the beer that we are making. So the salts that we add back are different depending on the style of beer that we're making. So we customise the water for exactly what we're doing. Thank you. Any other questions at all? Anybody thinking about career changes into the food industry? I was just expecting a younger demographic, but it's looking more like mid-career than early career people. Um, I guess similar to what we are talking about before, how much of that is sort of structured experimentation, sort of, a, of, the, sort of the scientific method approach, and what is, and hence, do you have a role for science type people here um, in your different scales of business I guess or and how much is just organic try it, see good enough, move on uh, So for, for us we're pretty little um, so we can make a thousand litres of beer and we can just see if it works or not and we're not, yeah, we're not losing sheep stations if it doesn't work um, so there is a bit of, yeah, sort of art, I guess, instead of science, but um, all, the, all the work that we do beforehand in coming up with a recipe is based on, is based on science um, and, yeah, getting the right water profiles and things, that's, it's all worked out mathematically with formulas and we do testing of our water regularly to make sure that what's coming out of the RO is what we expect to be coming out of the RO and what's coming out of our... Um, Brewing water is called liquor. What's coming out of our liquor tanks is having had the salts put into it is what we're expecting to come out there as well. Um, so there definitely is, um, yeah, scope for science within it. Um, we are in the process of putting in a little, a little tiny lab of our own. Um, so we're looking at starting um, to do our own yeast cultures and stuff so that we can propagate our own yeast instead of fresh buying yeast each time we do a brew and freshly pitching it. And then that enables you to have your own in-house strain and stuff as well. Um, so if someone comes to us and they've got a science background, like it's not going to be a purely science job, but yeah, definitely a science background would be super handy. So that, that might be something if you've gone and got your ticket from your whatever TAFE or something in the, the brewing science, but having an additional science experience background is going to... One of those things that might yeah, for sure. And um, one of the girls that I know who's just got into brewing in South Australia, she's got a food science background and hadn't had anything to do with brewing before, but she's yeah been taken on board because she's got that food science background, so she understands all about the chemistry to do with food. Being a company that does alcohol and non-alc, two very different processes. So on the alc side, because we can do it on smaller batches, we can do a product that only sells at the cellar door. So you can produce 200 bottles. Obviously, the price is going to be higher, but we can do those smaller batches where there is a bit more experimentation involved, um, both from a distilling perspective and from a winemaking perspective. A, a good example is when we launch Renmark, obviously up there, everyone knows it's famous for its citrus, but they also grow a lot of roses up there. So we, we had a rose-infused vodka that we only sold through the cellar door 
we got a few into our sales team and it's now a permanent line because no one had played in this space and people absolutely loved it. It's got this lovely pink tinge and a taste of uh, rose throughout the vodka. So it's certainly on the alcohol side, we can do those smaller, kind of try it, test and see. The non alc side, being fast-moving consumer goods, you need scale and you need volume. So there just isn't that room for small runs. Um, you know, we, we can't do a flavour just for South Australia because the economies of scale are so low, it becomes unprofitable for us. So that's where you use a lot more consumer groups, focus groups to tell you these are the flavours, these are the products people are looking for to go in a direction. And then we have a, a, a food technologist, although we call him a liquid technologist, and his job, he's the kind of, he's the Willy Wonka. I like dealing with our mate Dan because you give him brief and he comes back to you with 10 different products and you get to sit there and that's, that's, that's the fun part of the job. But uh, you need to be very sure that the one you pick is going to have broad appeal because, again, if you create something that's too niche in the, in the supermarket game, you won't last six months before the, the, the retailers have knocked you off the shelf. So both sides. And from a science position within our business, there's the food technology, but we also have in-house testing. So we have about six people in a laboratory that are constantly quality assuring everything. So every single batch before we release it to the, retail, the retailers, we sit it for three days and make sure there's no microbes there. So everything is... So there's that quality assurance science side as well as the product development? Um, yeah, good question. Science is um, really important. Um, I think if you want to get into food and beverage, um, science is the, the what to study um, or the background to have. Um, and I, then I think, um, you know, business and, and law is probably equally as good. I guess it depends what you want to do. If you want to be uh, employed by someone as um, a production person, um, then you probably want to be uh, like process engineering, perhaps, stuff like that, um, flavor chemistry, science. Um, if you want to be, um, if you want to have your own business and you want to manage the whole lot, then I think all of that plus business or law. Um, I'm learning as I, as I go through it. I wish I didn't have to pay other people to do that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. There's also a role for universities in that with small business too. Um, perhaps the largest grant I've worked on in collaboration with business was, or the more recent grant I've worked on, um, is a collaboration through the wine industry, playing with sparkling wine and French champagne. So that was a really hard project to work on. but. Um, there is funding through industry bodies if you are a small business in particular and you're not like Bigfoot's that's got a big R&D department where you can partnership with universities and the method development, product development they'll do will all be based on evidence-based practice, stuff that's already been published in the literature to sort of cut down the number of mistakes and fast track things. So you, there is the opportunity to tap into others with scientific backgrounds if if you don't have time or you don't have that area of expertise. Any other questions at all? Okay, thank you. All right, thank you everybody for attending this afternoon. I'd like to say, uh, thank our uh, guest speakers, um, Kate, Hugh and Sasha. And perhaps if you see any smiling Samoyed Bigfords um, products or uh, Hills Distillery, you can only buy them. Yeah, I'll just jump in there. Adelaide Hills Distillery, yeah. distributed nationally, available all over South Australia, if you want So to. where would they find them in store? I'd uh, go to a bottle shop. Any bottle you... shop. <laughs> any bottle shop. Support. Go to a good independent one first. Yeah, a good independent South Australian bottle shop. All right, thank you everybody and have an enjoyable afternoon.